This is Popping the Bubble with hosts Sandra Ponce de Leon and Pete A. Turner. Hi, this is Megan Kane. I'm Spire's Export Control Officer. And I'm Nick Lane, Spire's Head of Brand, and you're listening to Popping the Bubble. Hey guys, thanks yeah. so much for joining us. It's so great to have you here. Your company is so cool. We love it. We can't wait to hear all about what you guys are doing with satellite and space and analytics. Uh, super sexy company. Yeah, this is, I love you guys. You know, we go way back yeah. and I just, the fact that we get to sit and talk about what you guys do and, and we are in the middle of San Francisco. You guys build satellites. We do. Yep. And you throw them into space. And Lots they do things. Them. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. So this is... And you're not NASA. Yeah. No. Yeah. And you're not JPL. And you're not... like You guys are this just unique spot in the world. And you have such a, such a jump on anybody else who's doing this. It's, it's, I love what you guys do. Thanks. Thanks. Maybe we should explain what you do. <laughs> that, that might be a good idea. I, Why don't we start I there? I that if you'd like. <laughs> Nick, what do you guys of do? Of course, I, Pete, you could take what we do if you'd like to. <laughs> no, I, I, that's how much of a fan I am. I know a lot about it. <laughs> this is true. Uh, so Spire is a, um, a space-based data company. We do basically really, really in-depth uh, data and analytics, um, but we own the whole value chain. So we launch our own, we build our own satellites, we operate our own satellites, we operate our own ground stations. Um, we take the data, we transform the data, we clean it for people, and then we give them access via an API. Um, basically take all of the hard work of launching your own space program to get data and just deliver the data to, to our customers. What yep. kind of people? Um, so it's, it's a pretty broad spectrum. Um, we have three main products. So our first one is maritime data. Um, so it's every ship in the ocean that carries a a transponder every it, single ship uh, pretty much every every ship over a certain size ah okay okay that doesn't belong to a government that doesn't belong to a government yeah um navy ships are out <laughs> oh okay yeah. yeah but you have to ignore them like you still see them you don't see them at we all you don't see them at we all you don't see them at all okay yeah um the second product is weather data so we actually um take measurements about earth's atmosphere all around the globe um, and that's the kind of stuff that feeds into forecasts. Mm. So we don't provide forecasts, but we provide data that goes into forecasts. Um, and so like your, uh, when you go onto the weather.com app on your phone, someone's had to do all of the heavy lifting, all of the forecasts, like taking all the sources in, we're one of the sources. We're a, going to be at least a pretty big source mm -hmm. um, of that data. And then the third product, um, which comes out uh, later this year in beta, is uh, at aircraft tracking. So mm. everyone knows when MH370 disappeared. That wouldn't happen with you guys. Well, it, it might still happen, but at least the search smaller radius area. would be yeah, yeah. Much, much, much smaller. Much smaller. Yeah. Right. Could you guys track something as small as like Amelia Earhart's smaller size plane? If she carried a transponder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We don't track the actual objects. We track the transponder. I we got you. We pick up the radio signals. We like to say we listen to 85% of the Earth. Yep. 80. Well, what about the other 15%? Well, What's so up? That's, that's the percent of the earth that um, is already pretty heavily tracked. So like we're sitting here in San Francisco. Um, every one of us has a cell phone in our pockets. Might as well track things via cell phone. You know, right. you don't, you don't track things if they're not missing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That makes sense. 85% of the plant is covered in water or desert. The, fascinating. I, I can't imagine you guys having any competition. Um, there, there are competitors for each product, sort of. Um, we're a bit more um, on our own on the weather side. Okay. Um, because it's doing commercial weather data is an entirely new thing. There's two companies that won a contract with NOAA last year. Um, it was announced last September. We're one of them. Um, and, Tell us what NOAA is. Um, the National... Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. There we go. Thank you. Max. So they talk about chocolate. <laughs> no. no, they deal with weather. Is that right? They deal okay. with weather. Yes. Yep. Um, and so they've they've never. It's kind of a big deal. They've never purchased weather data from anyone. It's always been their creation of themselves or another government agency. Mm -hmm. We're the first satellites to, that they've ever bought data from. Is the quality of the weather data? I don't want to say better, but more accessible or something? Is there is there an improvement it's, over what they're getting? Yeah. So it's it's a technology that was actually proven out. Um, in Cosmic. Yeah, in Cosmic, which I was trying to think of when it was. It was about a decade ago. Uh, ago. 
Tell um, us what Cosmic is. So Cosmic was a um, a combination of uh, U.S. and I think Taiwanese government working together to um, to take a technology that was like entirely academic at the time and see if it actually worked in real life. Um, and this technology is called GPS radio occultation, which okay, that's a mouthful. It is a mouthful. <laughs> uh, the science of it's really cool. They it, it basically uses the GPS satellites, which are already in space. They're already up there. They're just basically legacy assets that are it's it's free data if you can do something with it. Um, and our satellites are kind of real real low on the atmosphere, so just scraping the top of the atmosphere basically. And uh, the, as the GPS signal passes through uh, the atmosphere, our satellite picks that up and measures how much the atmosphere affects that signal. Um, and then reverse engineers the temperature, pressure, and humidity for an entire slice of atmosphere. Wow. And then it does it like hundreds of times and over multiple satellites um, every day. So mm-hmm. you basically get tons of really great weather data. Is this kind of like a, a CAT scan of the atmosphere? Pretty pretty close i mean cat it's it's a little bit different it would almost be as if you had a cat scan um but it was uh let's say instead of like beaming something into your body to like take a reading mm-hmm. it was like um using the light fixtures in the room and the radiation that comes off those already mm-hmm. um because it's it's making use of a system that's already there and already producing signals so all we have to do is listen for it. I guess, I mean, like the result is, is that you get a slice of the atmosphere and then you can build a three-dimensional data model that says, this is what's happening in this area. Right. So that data tends to get, um, come through the API, get fed into something like um, NOAA's weather model, mm. which um, basically informs all the other weather models. So like weather.com running in the app on your phone, to some degree is using that, that weather model from NOAA. And so uh, this data then improves that forecast significantly mm-hmm. because it's incredibly precise data. Um, we have really, really good weather models. And the better the data that goes in, the better the results that come out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For, for decades, they've been working on, on weather models in the U.S. and in Europe and uh, Japan as well, where the, the data quality going into them hasn't necessarily improved that much. But forecasts have improved, and that's because the models have gotten great. Um, and now what we're doing is saying, hey, let's improve the quality of the data going in and improve the quantity of the data going in and see how amazing your great weather model becomes with even better data. Mm-hmm. Yep. Amazing. Is it possible that all that data being in now a spherical model, I mean, you know, if you put pressure on over whatever, Sudan, there's going to be responses throughout the entire world. Are you guys going to be able to start to provide data where where NOAA can start to say these things that are happening all the way across the world are going to create these other instances? Is that well? So we we already know that um, the the like talking with some of our folks here who are um, some of the best weather experts in the world. Um, I think one of the first presentations they gave was basically titled uh, "The Butterfly Effect Is Real." Wow. Like really? a butterfly flaps its wings, it does affect weather a week later somewhere else. Yeah. Now maybe it's it's such a minuscule amount that it doesn't matter, but uh, but that it really does like something happening in one location. Let's say something happening today in the tropics of Southeast Asia is going to affect California in a certain number of days. Um, and so the better the measurements we have going in, the better the forecast can be coming out. And these are like AI type elements where a human can't process all this stuff. They can't track all right, these data which, points to be able which to. Which is that. why um, there's lots and lots of computing power going into um, customer weather models. And that's uh, what the weather model like that NOAA has does. They take data from all over the world, not just nearby, and they predict what that will have, what effect that will have um, here in the United States. Yeah, I actually just came back from a a sailing trip in the Caribbean, and this was something that, you know, all of the sailors were very much just constantly checking the weather patterns with NOAA, and, you know, of course, it's it's hurricane season now, Mm -hmm. so trying to avoid those weather patterns as effectively Mm -hmm. as possible. You guys put satellites into space. Let's talk about that. Yes. Uh, Yes. Yeah, that's the cool part. There. What size? Describe these because I, I know what they look like, but I want the I want you to, to yeah. give the audience a chance to understand what we're talking about here. 
This is a little hard because, like, you guys know us so well that it's almost hard to, like, yeah. skip. we skip past all the cool stuff. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, we can back up and talk about cool stuff, too. But I think this is just yeah, fascinating because no, everybody in their mind pictures a radar dish or, like, like, a satellite dish and then three solar panels and then some antennas and stuff sticking yeah. out. That's not what you guys do. No, because people think, like, oh, uh, a satellite is the size of a bus or a car. We do satellites that are the size of a bottle of wine. Um, wow. Or yep. You know, a loaf of bread, whatever you want to. I was thinking about like a mailbox. You yeah. know, like yeah. a. It's you know, I think you could fit it in a, a mailbox. It's thinner. It could fit in a mailbox. Yeah. It could fit in a. Yeah, okay, there you go. It could fit in a mailbox. Yeah. And it weighs what about a hundred pounds or something like that? No, or? no, um, four point three kilograms. We, we're it's, in we're in America. You got well, yeah, <laughs> like ten, my, ten my pounds. Engineers, my engineers give it to me in kilograms. Uh-huh. So it's like ten pounds. It's like in that zone, right? Less than ten pounds. Two point two pounds per uh, per kilogram. So yep. All right. Yeah. Uh, so they're they're tiny. They're um, the dimensions of them are uh, ten centimeters by ten centimeters by thirty centimeters. It's actually thirty-two. Oh, okay, thirty-two. Thank <laughs> you. Well, you, I like these decameters because no one ever uses those. You know, okay, or de- so is it decimeters? One decameter it's, by yeah. one decameter by three decameters. Two. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So and then they go up and they're in a lower orbit. Than wait, other wait. Things. How how do they go up though? Well, they go on a rocket. I'm going to shut up. <laughs> yeah, tell so, us how they, how they go up. So they go up on basically any rocket that's going to an orbit that we want that can take our satellites. Where we like we're to say to that we're allowed to use. We like to say that we're launch agnostic. We don't really care who takes them up as long as they take them where we want to put them, which is just about everywhere. So that's kind of that kind of works out in our favor. Mm-hmm. Um, we essentially hitch a ride, um, and we've done it with uh, basically. Basically, everyone we can. The, the only, I think, the only one we've missed so far is SpaceX, which is kind of funny because they're both, <laughs> you know, California companies. We should both kind of be, uh, but uh, it, it's it's tough because launches get delayed, launches move, launches. Um, you, you get taken off a launch t- for something that's not your fault. Yeah, it ha- things happen. Um, yeah. it's the space industry. Stuff happens. Space is hard. Um, and the uh, so we've launched. So we've launched basically with. Almost everyone. We've launched on a Nepper rocket, which was out of... Um, Yasni in Russia. Thank you, Megan. Uh, we've launched on a... Uh, what was the, the recent one? Soyuz out of Baikonur in Kazakhstan, which oh, was also Russian. Which Megan went to. Um, it was so much fun. I just saw the video. It was. Have you launched cool. on a North Korean rocket? <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, we yeah. will not do that. Oh. So Megan, Megan has a compliance for us. <laughs> right. I should mention that. Right, yes. <laughs> right, right. Yes. Um, and so how many satellites do you guys have up in space? Uh, so right now we've got 40 producing da- forty Lemur 2 satellites producing data for our mainly for our maritime customers. Mm-hmm. Um, in total, we've launched 51. And h- how long do they last for? What is the lifespan of a satellite? Depends what orbit they go into. Okay. Yes. Um, occasionally they will go up with... Um, on an international space station resupply mission. And those kind of get booted out by the astronauts. And those last um, roughly about nine months, sometimes more, sometimes Lemur 2 came. Mine lasted for 11 months. Okay. I was very proud of it. Um, <laughs> Not that I had any. You did a great it, job. It, you did a you great guys, job, Megan. You guys <laughs> name these things, right? What was the one? You guys have a really funny name for one of them. I can't remember what it was. Cheese? Though. What's that? Cube, Cube cheese? cheese. Cube cheese. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> Before we get past this point, so uh, it goes up to the space station yep. and the astronaut kicks it out. How literal is that description? Um, fairly literal. I mean, they get um, they get loaded into a tiny little airlock. So they go up with – so it depends how they go up. But sometimes they go up on, on this lower orbit. They'll go up in the uh, air and water. Deployer. Yeah. They'll be in a, in a deployer box basically ready to go. Um, and they get loaded in with the air or the, or the water, the – food, that sort of stuff, the experiments, and they get hand taken by an astronaut in the in the deployer over to a tiny little airlock. In the Kibo module, the Japanese module. Yep. And then uh, the sort of they close the airlock, the robotic arm reaches around the other side of the space station, pulls it out, just kind of aims them out into space, the astronaut hits a button, the doors open up and springs like a jack in a box push them out into space. Yes. Our deployers are basically jack in the boxes. <laughs> so it really does get kicked out into it space. It does get kicked out into space. The astronaut says, we're it's sick of looking at these it. things. Send them somewhere else. <laughs> wow. They also get video of it for us. So you can look up 
videos of ISS deployments. Oh, how cool. Yeah. We're going to have to check those out. Yeah, there's, that is so fascinating. And there's a whole bunch of different ways that they'll, they'll go up as well. Like we've, we've gone up on the outside of that same resupply mission. Hmm. We were the first uh, small satellites to get deployed in an orbit above the International Space Station. So what they ended up doing was the module goes up, it attaches the space station, they unload everything, they stick their trash inside and whatever they want to get rid of, and they, they seal it back off, they kick it back out into space, and then they took that module, raised, did an additional burn of leftover fuel, raised its orbit up, and then deployed more satellites out of that. So oh. we've so we've done both deployments. We've done from the mm-hmm. ISS. We've done um, from the thing that brought the satellites Cygnus. Cygnus module to the ISS, and then went above. We've also done just the straight up um, deployment from the rocket itself, which um, mainly like that's like uh, an Indian launch. For us, and so the Soyuz, launch. And Soyuz launch, and Nepper as well. <laughs> the uh, the Indian launches are always fun because they they do a lot of cubesats, and oh, and they exciting. always give us a live stream, so it's always fun to watch. Oh, nice! Yeah, that's really cool. And so, so then when they come back into the atmosphere, it's just lost, right? I mean, yeah. because there's no recovery, and they and, burn up. And, right, they burn up. And and how much do these things to- cost typically? Uh, so in total, like launch and building them, less than a million dollars a piece. Mm-hmm. Um, What's a regular satellite cost to put up? Way Hundreds more. Hundreds of millions. <laughs> right, right. So you're talking a, a fraction of a fraction. Yeah. But still, yeah, it's a still, million bucks a pop. Well, yeah, and that's what my next question is, is what happens when oops happens? And you get it up. It doesn't, it doesn't work. It doesn't go into space. It gets there and, and someone forgot to plug it in or whatever. I mean, not that that's happened. So, yeah. But yeah, that, you know, what happens? Well, so we kind of knew from the beginning that um, that, that sort of thing is something that, that does happen to satellites. It happens to our competitors in the maritime space. We have a competitor there who launched satellites and expected them to last, I don't know, eight, ten years. And after two they're having trouble contacting them Mm. like space happens (laughs) (laughs) Uh, and it's it's kind of a numbers game Mm -hmm. so for us we launch a ton of satellites and we expect them to work for a couple of years like two years is our operational lifespan of these satellites and after that they they would just sit they wait to deorbit and they do deorbit pretty quickly so um, some of them don't even make it that long they're up there for nine months or Mm -hmm. 11 months in Megan's case um and uh, we just know that, um, and you know, not every time a satellite works perfect. Sometimes they mm-hmm. they develop quirks. Our operators like to say that every satellite has its own personality. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, and all of them have their own name too. So they'll say whoever's it is, uh-huh. like Kane is having issues, or <laughs> Peter is behaving. And well, do they go to or, Peter and go, "What's up with your satellite?" It, <laughs> it has been known to happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it, fantastic. Yeah. And, and, you know, like, uh, we, we've got this idea that we always iterate quickly on things. And it's a very Silicon Valley thing. Absolutely. Um, we treat our satellites like anyone treats software. Mm-hmm. We're, uh, I think we're accounted the other day, we're up to our 13th generation of satellite. Mm. Wow. Which, um, and that's like hardware differences between each generation. There are lots more software dis- differences. Exactly. Where, where do you guys manufacture them? So they're actually manufactured over in the UK in Glasgow. Mm-hmm. Um, I love our Glasgow office. Yeah, our Glasgow office is very nice. Um, we've got a full um, clean room and testing facility there. Um, we actually just expanded it downstairs um, to include um, bigger clean room, um, more benches for building more satellites, um, and our own RF chamber, which is like, if you can imagine like the thing you see in the movies where They've got like, or, you know, on NASA test videos where they've got a thing in a room and it's got like crazy spiky foam ceiling floor walls um, and it's very dark. And when you talk, you don't hear any echo back. Uh, it's cool. that exact type of. Like chamber. that room from uh, Armageddon exactly. when they're doing the psych profiles. Ex- oh, yes. Yeah, yeah just like yes. that. <laughs> they weigh about 10 pounds. They're, they fit inside of a mailbox. They go up for six months to two years or whatever why not launch them a little deeper into space so they stay up longer well space is a a weird thing um atmosphere is exponential and it causes drag on satellites Mm. however um that's mostly the case for leo once you get out past low earth orbit there's very very little drag and any amount of mass you put up there tends to stay up there a really really long time like hundreds or thousands of years oh so you get above 700 kilometers, you're going to be up there for a really long time. It's kind of agreed internationally that 
you bring your stuff down within 25 years of it oh. being no longer functioning. Or move it into a graveyard orbit if you're too far out. Right. And you guys are wanting to iterate anyhow. Right. So you, you put it into a, a, an orbit where the obsolescence is planned. and 400 you... to 600 kilometers. Yep. So basically huh. they, they come down um, in a pretty reasonable time frame and we're not leaving any space junk up there. Um, it's kind of the, they're the Prius of satellites. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody gets mad at it? <laughs> yeah, everyone gets stuck, stuck on it. Yeah. <laughs> beyond, beyond the weather uh, and uh, applying the data to uh, predicting weather better, weather, weather patterns better, what are the other applications, business applications you guys yep. use the data for? So the, the main other one is maritime data. So uh, basically that's the every ship in the ocean that we talked about. Mm-hmm. And um, the that's really, it's it's kind of breaking down into a few things. It's a, it's a raw data feed for people that in the industry that like shipping companies and, and people that are used to um, needing up-to-date information about where their ships are or that sort of thing. There's a whole other really interesting subset of customers that are also using that type of data. A lot of those are like really cool analytics projects. Um, so, for example, there's a customer of ours called Global Fishing Watch, mm-hmm. and they're supported by Google and the Leonardo DiCaprio found- Foundation. And what they're doing is basically performing really, really detailed analytics on top of this AIS automatic identification system data. And uh, tracking commercial fishing in the ocean mm. and trying to figure out where people are performing fishing illegally. Oh, wow. And, That's uh, great, considering our, the fish populations are going down, right? Right. And so, like, you're, you're looking at uh, a really, really large threat to the world's protein supply. Yeah. And so they're creating this platform where you can go on their website and you can, you can get a basically a near real-time map of where all of the like risk our areas are for illegal fishing. Wow. Yeah. That's really cool. I mean, that's great. What what else? Um, so there's there's a whole bunch of other stuff. There's people doing uh really cool anti piracy efforts. Oh, um, uh-huh. You don't even think that like we're in twenty seventeen, you don't think like pirates are a problem. I heard Venezuela is a hot spot for pirates right now. Yeah, so there's a few areas where basically where there's pretty desperate people, you end up with pretty desperate measures. Yeah. And piracy, if you have the ocean there, um, piracy is one of those things that happens. And um, what, what are the other places to stay away from? Uh, stay away from gosh, the pirates. The Horn of, the Horn of <laughs> Africa is, is always an issue. You know, some it, it ebbs and flows, but that's, that's tough places. Yeah. Desperate people there. Yeah. And there's um, also, so there are some hot spots around Southeast Asia that are oh, yeah, kind of interesting. Right. I was looking at a, a map of piracy and you saw some like some issues in Southeast Asia and you saw some issues in uh, the northern north uh, western part of Australia. And I was looking at that going, I didn't expect to see a hot spot in the northwest of Australia. I expected it in Southeast Asia, but they're very they're very close to each other, but there was nothing in the middle. And uh, when you looked at the the data, you saw that they were pulling terrestrial data for most of this stuff and that no one really knew if there was anything happening in the middle because there was hmm. no data there because once you got past 50 miles from land, all signals drop off um, without satellite data. Mm. Now we're going to start to see, okay, is there something happening in the middle there where we thought it was safe? Maybe it's not. What do you do about that? I mean, I know that's not your guys' product, mm-hmm. but if you're 500 miles from anything, what the heck? Like, you, you can't call for help. Well, it's, it's more about being proactive about it so okay. if you know that there's piracy happening in a region you adjust your route to avoid that area right nowadays you've got this you've got enough data that you can if something happens in a region or there's you know a, a spike a certain time of year and you know about it um you can kind of do a better job of that because there's better data sources so if you want to be a good pirate you could call spire <laughs> <laughs> it has it has been we've been known to joke about that but <laughs> Uh, there's plenty of sources online where they could get that sort of sure. data, sort of data. You guys work in a really, really cool uh, place and a cool space. No pun mm-hmm. intended. Um, is there, um, you know, what, what what got you guys here? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, uh, uh, us us personally or yeah, the you company? personally? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. How um, did you get into Spire? Well, so you started before me, so you go first. Okay, thanks, Meg. <laughs> I started before Megan by like three days. Um, <laughs> 
so about five, a little, four and a half, five years ago, um, I was working at Brown University doing media production and application stuff. I had always been interested in startups. Mm-hmm had run my own company, a film production studio in Massachusetts, and um, had just kept my eye on things, kept my eye on AngelList, looking at the latest companies around. Mm -hmm. And AngelList had just launched what I called dating for startups. And uh, it was basically hot or not, but it would give you like, this company is looking for these sort of people. Would you be interested in this company? And I saw a satellite company and I thought, yeah, I looked at the positions. Nothing here is something I'm that they'd hire me for, but I'll just say yes, because who wouldn't say yes to a space company? Right. And sure enough, like the next day I had uh, an email from AngelList. It was kind of a, intro- it was an auto introduction. It was Nick, meet Peter, Peter, meet Nick. You guys should chat. And um, Peter happened to be looking for someone who could do more things around um, content creation. And so uh, we chatted on the phone for, actually we, we chatted on Skype for 15 minutes then he gave me a quick project. I did it over the weekend, shot mm-hmm. it back to him really fast. And he called me up to do a five-minute salary negotiation. And so after 20 minutes of talking to someone, I was on a plane heading to California for wow. a job that I was fairly certain existed. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and yeah, it was, it was just a, a real quick turnaround. And he wanted me here. He was like, can you be here Monday? And I was like, I need to tell brown that i'm leaving first (laughs) (laughs) and so he gave me a couple weeks to get get my butt out here wow and what about you megan so my story is a bit different um i knew three of the founders peter joel and yarun from university oh so i had actually emailed peter back in december saying hey i heard you guys are doing really well if you need any help with anything let me know and And you're saying university but i'm not gonna let you get away with just saying that (laughs) So you're going to have to expand out. Okay. Where where were you and Peter at school together? In France at the International Space University. Oh. I love Strasbourg. And what was your degree in? Uh, my degree is a Master of Science in Space Management. That is incredible to be able to say those words. You know, like I I have a master's degree in organizational management. You win. Like, <laughs> You're organizing all of space. That's fantastic. So there are two degrees offered, uh, space studies and space management. And uh, So you met Peter at the, at the university. Yes. And you said, hey, I hear you guys are doing things. And well, then- no, I'd been following it the whole time. And mm-hmm. in December, um, I had emailed him at saying, hey, I'm not employed at the moment. Uh, but if, So if you need any help with anything, let me know and I'll help. And in February, I got an email from him. It was... Thursday, then I want to say around the 19th, I don't remember exactly. Um, and he sent me an email saying, hey, would you maybe be kind of interested in coming out to San Francisco? Uh, I said, sure. I had a quick phone call with Teresa. What was the conversation you had with your parents about doing this? Well, I didn't have a conversation with them until after I talked with Teresa. <laughs> and my conversation with them was after Teresa sent me my acceptance, saying six months in San Francisco, potential to expand beyond that. Oh, in that interview, she asked me uh, about would I stay on longer if they got the funding. I said, as long as I don't get offered a chance to go to Mars. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You are you are on the list of people trying yes, to get to Mars. on Mars One. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. And what's your role, Megan, here at the company? I'm the Export Control Officer and Global Compliance Manager now. Okay. I started out as office manager about, what, five days after I got that initial email from Peter? Everything you guys do is an export, right? I mean, like nothing's staying here. (laughs) Everything's way exported. Well, technically, if you launch from the United States, it's not considered an export to send it into space. I had no idea that that was was even possible. (laughs) And what's the percentage of launches you guys are doing from the United States? Uh, oh, International wow. Space Very Station low. launches are all delivered yeah. to NASA, so... Yeah, it sounds like you guys uh, are way more international in terms we of your do. launches, Yeah, right? the, the problem with that is basically that um, there's uh, a very limited number of launches that will will go to our orbit. There's a subset of those that will carry a commercial satellite. There's a subset of those that will carry a CubeSat, and there's a subset of those um, that, you know, one of our competitors hasn't already 
bought on with a contract and has blocked us from getting on or something along those lines. Like, uh-huh. so basically you, you start out with a really big pie and then it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So you, you get on a U.S. launch, but you also have to book a, an Indian launch or you also have to book most, a Japanese launch. Yeah, most of our launches from the United States have been to the International Space Station. When you guys are planning this thing, this this is a unique Rolodex to be able to command that to say, okay, I'm talking to NASA, I'm talking to SpaceX, I'm talking to all these different organizations negotiating for mm-hmm. space, you know, when you got competitors trying to get it. But ultimately, you guys are kicked out with the trash too, so... <laughs> and I'm, you know, that's what happens. So yeah. you must get a break on price because you you guys are tiny. It, you must just fill the tiniest little space we inside there. We are ballast. We are ballast. Right. Yeah. This is where I was going with this. So, yes. Wait, what's ballast mean? <laughs> okay. So on a rocket, you need to balance the payload. Otherwise, the rocket will roll or go side to side. Okay. So they calculate what ballast they need based on the primary payload and then... What they've started doing is selling that extra space mm. to smaller satellites and especially to CubeSats. So the most recent Russian mission we were on, there were 75 payloads on this one rocket going oh. up. I think it was 107 on one of our Indian yeah. launches. Yeah, it was a, or 108 or something like that. It's a lot. Um, basically what happens is... Uh, CubeSats have somewhat turned into cost recovery. So if you've got a large satellite going up and you're a primary primary payload, so you had to pay for the whole rocket, whether you use it or not. And so a lot of these folks will go, well, let's just resell that, that extra makes space. Sense. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because they would have to pay for it to be filled anyway. So JPL wants to hitch a ride on, or wants to put a, a, a rover into space. You guys are going to hitch a ride on that. They're going to, JPL is going to sell you their ballast space. Is that Yeah. And right? usually it will go through a, a third party in there. So there's a broker there's even a in broker that? broker in there, yeah. Who knew that job existed? Yeah. It, well, that's, that's fair. <laughs> I'm a space do. space broker. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There is a there, there are brokers for this, and um, mm-hmm. and it's it's funny because you you've got brokers. You can if you're primary, you usually go direct. Sometimes go direct, um, and then there's uh, there have been a couple. There there there's some small satellite uh, launchers now. So there's a Rocket, Rocket Lab, Lab in New Zealand who's who just completed their first test uh, flight. Why and the second one, right? I think. Uh, we've got a contract with them to do future to do future flights. Basically, that would be cool because we'll be you know one of a few CubeSats on on the rocket, and that's it. It's not uh, there's no big sat- satellite that's going to slow everyone else down if they're if they're late to delivery, and there's not like uh, there's there's no one else pulling the strings. It's basically a, a contract to launch our satellites, and here's the date, which is going to be and real orbit. interesting. And here's the orbit that that you want to go to. Hmm. We don't get to pick our orbits. We say, oh, you're going to something that works for me. Great. Can mm-hmm. I come? Will that improve your data? It will over time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Constellation planning is helpful, but. Yep. Um, what does that what mean, can? constellation planning? Where you plan which orbits you want to be in. Uh, most large constellations, like the GPS constellation or one web that's going up or whatever, mm-hmm. they plan where they want to put their satellites. Right, right, And right. what orbits to get the best refresh, to get the best thing. They construct where they want them to go, and then they buy launches, pick launches to put them in the right places. So we, we have a very, very talented person named Jenny Barna, who is our launch manager. Yes. Her entire job is procuring launches and making sure we're put in the right place. And and there's a lot of technical details of that. I mean, she's a literal rocket scientist. Wow. So she oversees this whole process. Early on, she had done a simulation between what Megan was talking about, which is a planned constellation, and basically just getting on every rocket you possibly can at random. Hmm. The... At, at least at the beginning, starting out a constellation, there was very little actual difference in the data quality between a planned and an unplanned constellation because an unplanned constellation with a ride share is so random already mm. um, because you're hitching rides mm-hmm. right. uh, that it just sort of, it kind of takes care of a lot of the randomness for you. <laughs> we just have to shake our heads for a minute. I'm still stuck We're on that. Fact- yeah, there's, that there's a lot of big words being thrown around here <laughs> and I, abbreviations. Yeah, and- <laughs> I just learned that there's a space space broker. I didn't. That's still blowing my mind. 
There's a there's another job out there for you. <laughs> I know, no kidding. Like I want to go do that for a while. I, I want to interview Jenny. Have her come down. I'm like just just slow down and say one word at a time so I can hang with you because that's incredible. <laughs> Rocket scientist. On top of that, you guys used to build the satellites here in the city. Do you still do that? So we don't do that here anymore. Um, we just did our first, I think, three here, mm-hmm. um, and uh, then we four. moved four. Yeah, Lemur one. Oh yeah, that's right. Lemur one was here as well, and then we moved manufacturing over to Glasgow. Um, which is a great city for manufacturing. I mean, there's just a there's a history of manufacturing in that city, um, and uh, it just makes it a lot easier for us to like move things and people around when we're when we're located and building stuff there. What are some of the happy coincidences or instances that happen because you're in this business? You're like, oh, by the way, now that we're in space and doing all this, we have who knew? Hmm. Do you want to talk about Artisat? Well, you you go ahead. <clears throat> so Ardusat was actually our very first payload, and our very first satellites were named after it. It's an education program that we support, and at one time it was our primary payload, where you can program an experiment to run in space and off of space data that gets downloaded. So it's own company now. Like as totally separate from Spire? It, yep. I mean, it's a, it's a, a subsidiary. subsidiary. Okay. Yep. It's a subsidiary. But this was an unknown thing until you got up there and realized it existed? No, or? that was our. that's what we ran our Kickstarter campaign on because uh. our, our company started in a classroom in France Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we were all at the university in April of 2012. Okay. Kickstarter campaign was run in the summer, raised 103000 Dollars to pay for the hardware for the first two satellites, nothing else. Wow. And what were the contributors contributants getting? Uh, that? Various things, Nick. Pictures you- and uh, t-shirts, and I think just the typical Long Kickstarter stuff. things. Cool space, mm-hmm. yeah, spacey cool space stuff. stuff. Yeah. Getting your name put. Uh, on uh, the satellite, like uh, not uh-huh. written, but like on the data banks of the satellite, or mm-hmm. whatever. Yep. Like a jar of space air. Like, well, no, no. <laughs> there's just no tell pressurized containers just, allowed just, on a satellite. Just, Making just, a jar of space air would be vacuum. That's the joke. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Actually, my joke was just you'd hand you hand him something like, this was, is from space. Really and maybe he didn't know it, but he made a really good space nerdy joke. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't expect a space nerdy joke. Though, therefore, I assumed it was air. That's why I screwed it up. <laughs> I was just saying, you're just going to you know grab a ball jar and put a lid on it and be like, this is from space. I, I knew someone in high school who sold the ghost in a jar that way. See? <laughs> <laughs> so so you have this idea. What other things like, um, you know, just by being up, you're learning things and you're developing mm-hmm. new products. What are some of those kind of – and can you talk about that? Um, so one of, one of the fun things is all the different, like, proposals that we get for things. Um, we've had all kinds of crazy stuff, like someone uh, – asking us to put like Bitcoin miners in space, Mm -hmm. um, which is like, uh, why would you want to do that? Um, Because they run more effectively up there. Yeah, but they don't. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And and there's like a, there's kind of like this subset of like ongoing conversations that are just always happening. Um, I mean, I, I sort of, I get all of our, strange emails like i'm i'm on our info at spire.com so i get all the strange ones um i was telling our one of our lawyers t- this morning about how uh i got an email from a guy once that was trying real hard to get in touch with the cia so he could tell them about the alien bases on mm. your ports oh um and i mean just you just get strange strange and of things. course you guys can c- confirm that I, with your data <laughs> cannot confirm or deny <laughs> um and you know it's it's an interesting field to be in because uh you kind of do have to un- expect the unexpected mm-hmm. um uh, you know you might think that a launch is happening in a day a week um it may get pushed out a month mm-hmm. a year two years you may decide to move those satellites to a different rocket um because it's taking so because long. Because it's taking so long. So Yeah, I mean, there could be – you could put that thing on, and I'll just say a truck from Scotland or from the mainland of, of Europe over to Kazakhstan. And by the time you get there, there's been a coup in Georgia, their Georgia, not our Georgia. You sure. know, and it's like, oops. The, um, the whole incident with uh, Russia and Crimea happened while we were transporting a satellite. So, oh, wow. Yes. Um, we one. Yep. So that poor satellite had to get dragged into an embassy or something and oh, wow. shown its paperwork and said, look, we, we really need to get this to the launch site. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, so the courier had to do a little extra work there. Yeah, no kidding. Like you don't even think of all the things that happen because it's not A to B. It's nope. A to twenty-seven. You know, like, it's yeah. really hard. And that's why we have Megan. <laughs> yes, I uh, deal with all of our export and legal issues that come up with that. Jenny and I meet every week to go over. That's right, what because you're exporting the, the satellite week, from right, here to wherever launches. it launches. Right, and satellites are are in similar categories to weapons and nuclear yes. arms and that sort of thing. So you have to be Luckily, real careful. We're not on that list anymore. Thankfully. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, good job. <laughs> yeah, uh, they changed that. The law was passed when I joined, just before I joined Spire. Whose law is that? I mean, we're we talking about well, like Obama passed it, but it's basically so it's a U.S. law. US it's a U.S. law. law. That removes a lot of items from the basically military list. And then what about, you know, Kazakhstan's law? Like, they're like, oh, well, that's a bomb. You know, like, how do you, like, <laughs> you have to manage so many pieces. It's just crazy. You do have to manage lots of different pieces. A lot of times the importation and the laws of the location where the launch is going up from, once you've integrated your satellite into the deployer, once you put it in the deployer and you've turned that over and it's been added to the primary payload, it's the launch provider's responsibility or the primary mm. payload's responsibility for getting that license to be able to go up from the location. And as many times as we run into like, uh, like, oh, we make, need to make sure we don't trip over, over that law or we need to be cognizant of this or we also run into the opposite, which is we go to a country where there's they don't have a law for that. <laughs> right. Which is actually which, more difficult. Yeah, it is more difficult. Because they just don't know if they can. You just get can a blank we, stare. Yeah. Can, we, can I put a ground station here? Yeah. What's that? Right. Uh-huh. Well, so it does this. Is there a space lawyer? Lots. Yeah. <laughs> I, I had no idea that existed until right now. <laughs> so you hang a shingle up in the uh, in the strip mall, and you're like, I I sue space or whatever, right? And, and then people, do, oh, oh, never mind. Well, <laughs> space itself doesn't have its own lawyer, but, but it does have its own laws. They're governed by international treaties, and I can talk about them, but I won't unless you ask me to. <laughs> I, I, I'm still dealing with space lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but uh, one of the weirdest things about joining a space company is how many lawyers people have to interact with. I think um, I've, I lost track of how many lawyers, because you, you take a normal company, which you might have a, a law firm on retainer to handle like trademarks or patents, but we've got trademarks and patents. And then we've also got um, export yep. control. We've also got RF licensing launch. Uh, there's other things to do with launch in the FCC and NOAA. Yep. We've got our own general counsel in-house. Um, basically, like... Uh, that happened when we were, like, three and a half years old? Three and a half years old. And so, basically, uh, people come to me and they'll ask, like, uh, what? why should I not start, start a space company? And it's, like, one of the best reasons yeah. is all of the paperwork. <laughs> right. Well, I was just... I was holding my head together because it was trying to explode as you were talking. I was just thinking about all these things that you have to account for. Like, I want to ask the question, like, how many times in a month do you guys get an email where you all just look at it and go, no one's ever written this email in the history of man. Like, this <laughs> message is never... And here it is, and I've got this, this issue, this hurdle, this thing that I have to get through. And literally... This conversation, these combination of words have never existed. And you're just like, I mean, you know. I think we, we, I'd say that we come across a, f- a new first at least once a month. Okay. Um, wow. Like, I know me personally, I come across one every once in a month. So I'm yeah. sure that. Yeah, it must have throughout yeah. the company. Yeah. And then as these things come up, you guys become an industry leader for all of it, not just in your niche, right. but like, oh yeah, we know how to solve that problem because we had that back in 2015 or whatever. And there's also times where like, we'll look at a problem and we'll go, um, how do we solve that? And someone has to go, well, we have to become the first. Jeez. <laughs> yes. <laughs> look, so for instance, you go, how do we get our latency time down on our satellites? Well, we need a lot of ground stations. Well, how do we do that economically? Well, we're going to have to become the largest provider of or creator operator of ground stations for low earth orbit. So we go out and we build. Is that what you guys are doing now? Is that that, that. that. we have that. You've you've already done that. Yes. We've already put ground stations in a whole bunch of different countries all over the U S and built out the world's largest Leo ground station network. So you guys are like ground station B and B. Like if someone wants to 
use your ground station space. You guys. So can that's not a service we offer right now. It's kind of complicated. Okay. But but I mean that's that's actually an uh, an emerging product. It could be. Yeah. I mean, if you want to put a ground station in, you can invent your own or potentially partner with somebody else. It's real painful to start new ground stations. So like, I bet. Very very painful. Mm. Why? Licensing. Uh, around the world, not to mention that it's difficult to talk to space. So when Megan when Megan says licensing, uh, you have to kind of think about like this: the cell phone that you carry in your pocket has a bunch of radios in it. That mm-hmm. it went through a thorough vetting process with the FCC to make sure that it wasn't going to interfere with any other devices. Um, so your cell phone went through a process that made sure that like the iPhone in your pocket won't interfere with every, everyone else's Android and cause them to not be able to make emergency calls. And it made sure that it wasn't going to be putting off RF radiation when it said it wasn't going to and interrupt police mm. or military. That's another big one. Yes. And every single country has its own rules around which services we, we use, which frequencies. Like and one place we wanted to put a ground station, we didn't because it interfered. It operated on the same, our ground station operates on the same frequency as the, uh, what's the thing that they put in your heart? Uh, pacemakers? pacemaker yes pacemakers in that country so it was decided we weren't going to install a ground station in the country where if it it could interfere with that right yeah there's so, just so I mean, many just, yeah, different just, factors and everything that you guys are there doing is an it's international pretty, group that does it but. yeah but still i mean you do you get that email it's like nope no ground station here because of pacemakers and you just sit back from your computer and go right well then you just <laughs> drop another pin on the map and yeah. uh then you go out and you do a, a survey to make sure that it will. You can actually build one there because you might look around and go, "Nope, there's buildings in the way." Because you have to have a clear mm-hmm. view of the sky. And then you go, "Well, I guess there's a mountain over there that's going to block us. Can't do that." And then you measure the RF spectrum, and it turns out that some guy has uh, built his own ham radio mm. thing, and it's you know it's in another country. They don't they're not really very strict about it. And it's giving off a ton of RF noise and we'll never be able to talk to our satellite through all that noise. Mm. And so you got Just because of a guy with a ham radio? It could be a guy with a ham radio. It could also be a cell phone tower. Uh huh. Yeah. Wow. Yep. And it could also be a, mil- a government facility. Government facility. Mm-hmm. And you can't go tell the government facility, like, shh, be quiet. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> It's fascinating. And we're kind of rounding the bend here on, on we'd love to have you guys on again. I'm, sure. I'm going to speak yeah, for you yeah, in that, yeah, right? Because no, it's so fascinating. And, yeah. Well, what, you know, what's next for you guys? And yeah. um, I, I know you guys are hiring. So tell us a little bit mm-hmm. about that as well. So next for us, I think, is just uh, more expansion. So we're going to be, um, we've, we've reached a really good pro- point with our products, especially the maritime product, where we're pulling down a ton of data for our customers. And it's awesome. So we start to get to see people actually use things the way we wanted them to be used. Um, and we also like hear about new things that we never even dreamed of, of happening. Um, and uh, so next up is just more of that. Um, and in order to do that, we have to put out really, really awesome analytics products. Um, we, we, I think probably by the time this, this comes out, um, we'll have, we'll be talking about our, uh, uh, how many vessels that we're tracking in the oceans. So we've got this database. Basically, rather than taking all this noise of millions of messages from ships every day, because we just suck it all up like a vacuum, rather than having to process that themselves, our customers are able to use our vessels API and just say, where is the St. Mary? And our database will tell you, St. Mary, last time we saw it, it was here. And here's all the information you you asked for about that ship. Then you can build things on top of that. So like our customers are, they'll ask for like, hey, when was the last time you saw that ship? And it's like, well, we haven't seen it for about four hours. And they go, well, I really like to know where it is now. Um, Mm -hmm. And it turns out you don't need necessarily to know exactly where it is now in order to get them the answer they want. You can do machine learning on top of that and figure out through machine learning where it probably is with a really, really high certainty. Right. And so building over those, that machine learning and those, those really, really cool analytics is really what's next for, for this type of data. And of course, we need really, really great people to do it. Yep. Uh, so software engineers um, and then hardware engineers in Glasgow and um, Spire.com really just has, has all the listings that we've got on there. And 
Um, if you want to work in marketing, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, thank you guys so much for an amazing conversation. Kind of mind-blowing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And we get our minds blown a lot, but this is just super mind-blowing. And, and I'll just say this for your guys' credit. I've known you guys for a long time. I love what you do. I can testify. Anybody who wants to work in a space company, you guys are it. It's fantastic. You have a great vibe, great people here. You've done. You've built a wonderful company, and we get Thank to see you. all kinds of companies. But what's really special? What you guys do here? I'd I'd love to get you guys to one of our other offices. So I should mention we are we're San Francisco, but we're also Boulder, Colorado. Mm-hmm. We're also Glasgow in the UK, which we mentioned, and we also have an office in Singapore. So let's, if people let's take like a trip, the heat. Pete. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. yeah this. That, it's neat. You guys are everywhere, and you have ground stations. You yeah. know, so yeah. who knows where the heck you end up? And you, so Megan has been. I know you've been to Russia, well, Kazakhstan. Yes. You worked in Scotland. You've yep. been San Francisco twice in just a matter of a couple of years. Uh, so, Five years. Yes, about four and a half years at this point. So, for Spire, I've been to a lot of places. Mm-hmm. And then maybe to Mars. Uh, Mars is the goal, right? Eventually. Uh, <laughs> It's fantastic. I love it. Thank you guys so much for being on the show. Thank you. 